um, like Dave was mentioning with the, with the berries, like with leaves, um, you know, if you pound them with a rock, what colors do you get if you rub rocks together? Um, so I think sometimes setting up sort of assignments or projects where they have choice, but they also have room to explore uh, also gives them a brain break from a lot of the work they have to do on their computers these days. Yeah, I totally agree. And to Dave's point about meeting objectives as well as engaging kids, um, I'm not going to say we need to lighten up, but I think people are already getting weary. I'm sensing that uh, and that we may have to just adjust our expectations to some degree about the principles or the elements of art that we're trying to teach right now and just keep them creating. That's just my personal opinion. All right, well, I'll continue. Um, let's see. So, as you know, there's so many natural materials at our disposal here in Vermont. Uh, these are just a few examples of things that have been done. The uh, photograph on the left is a sculpture made by an adult uh, at Sculpture Fest. And if you're not aware of Sculpture Fest, it's an annual exhibition that takes place outdoors on the property of Charlotte and Peter Davenport in Woodstock. Um, Charlotte knows a lot of these artists personally and is meeting new ones all the time and she invites people to create pieces, some of which are permanent on her property and some which stay no longer than two years. Um, so that's a great resource. Charlotte welcomes schools to come and visit. Uh, sometimes there have been scavenger hunts created so that classrooms can have kind of um, a purpose once they arrive. Uh, but the other photos are simply things that have been done in other seasons, uh, which we may not be able to do exactly right now, certainly not the snow, um, but just creating cairns in the river is a great activity. And then as I mentioned above, rubbings and mosaics and casting animal tracks and, and so much more. Um, as Leanne mentioned, Andy Goldsworthy is a go-to for all of us, I think. Um, I know I assigned mandalas for this week and asked the kids to look at some of the videos of Andy Goldsworthy, particularly the ones in which one of his pieces collapses or fails, because I really think that helps them to understand what perseverance is all about. Um, I've done a lot of Andy Goldsworthy, mostly at the National Park in Woodstock with groups of sixth graders, but I've done it with all ages. Um, I typically um, really try to push kids to choose one or two materials when they do an Andy Goldsworthy work, um, simply because that's what Goldsworthy does. He focuses just on icicles or just on stones of different colors or um, just on leaves that are attached together with thorns. So it's, it's kind of a, an instinct for kids to grab as many different things as they can find. And that's great too, but I do like them to kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, push themselves to stretch one material as far as they can go. Um, so there's the Andy Goldsworthy piece. Um, logistics, I don't really think this slide is necessary for most of you, but um, for anyone who hasn't done a lot of outdoor art, I think there are some things you just need to consider um, in terms of work surfaces and seating. I know I have classes that I sometimes try to take out first thing in the morning and the ground is covered completely with dew and, you know, they're uncomfortable. So you want to do whatever you can to make kids comfortable. Um, I often ask kids to carry things. So having containers with lids is really helpful. Inevitably, someone needs water or the bathroom. And I've never successfully done um, a large group of kids outside without some sort of shade nearby, whether it's a tree or a building or a pavilion. Um, and I don't go anywhere outdoors without a phone or a camera. Um, for a few reasons to record something that might disappear, you know, an ephemeral piece like a Goldsworthy work. Uh, or if they run out of time and need to remember what they were drawing or painting, um, we'll have a photograph. And sometimes it serves as simply an incentive um, to encourage kids to keep working and get something done because then I'll take a photograph of it and 
post it somewhere. Um, Joan and I mentioned this to each other yesterday, just really important, especially right now. I know ticks have been so prevalent in our neck of the woods. I, I hope it's not the case everywhere, uh, but just make sure that you're checking for ticks um, and encouraging kids at home to check for ticks if you're having them go outside to make art. Uh, and I think a great project would be uh, to challenge your students to design the most beautiful tick possible. Um, in terms of heading outside to really look at the landscape, uh, I do spend a lot of time teaching just direct observation and encouraging kids to just put their imagination on hold for a bit and really look at what the outdoors has to offer them. And these are just some of the perennial issues that we run into all the time. And I'm sure many of you have good tips for how to handle these, but, and I know developmentally it's appropriate for a kindergartner, first grader, second grader to put the sky at the top of the paper and the grass at the bottom and nothing in between. Um, but I think there are ways that you can kind of guide kids um, even by starting a drawing at the top edge of the image and working your way down so that they see that the sky actually does meet the land um, visually. And then looking truly at the color of water to see um, that it's not necessarily just the reflection of blue back to your eye, um, that there are a lot of other things that you see in the water. To really look at trees to see how branches do proceed to get smaller as they grow. Um, to look for where horizons actually are in an image and um, you know what things draw your attention first. What do you see initially when you look at a specific landscape? So those are some of the direct observation points. Um, and then uh, looking more closely, really noticing details. Uh, I have had students who have used, you know, a couple different media to look at the same thing. Um, the images on the left are a nature photo that a sixth grade girl took last year and then an acrylic painting that she made from it. Um, the poster in the center is an Arbor Day submission. Um, and this kid won a prize for that. Uh, it, I choose my contests quite carefully and I don't really know what kind of great contests are going on right now. I haven't really looked into it, but I'm sure there are some um, that your students could be submitting to. It tends to motivate kids to do really quality artwork, particularly if it's a contest that requires some sort of scientific knowledge or some sort of very specific content. Um, information. And then the, um, the clay leaves are just simply a, a project that lets kids, especially younger kids, trace a shape and, and turn it into a three-dimensional form. And then the take apart drawing is something I've done on a lot of occasions where kids will um, choose an object from outdoors and draw the exterior and then open it up, draw the interior, and then do a close-up drawing of something um, inside it. Thoughts? Comments? I'm not really checking the chat box. I don't know, Luis, is there anything in there? There are a lot of great videos online too, you know, in terms of inspiration, it's pretty much everywhere we go. And, you know, one of the biggest things I was doing was putting things off until um, you know, things got a little warmer, thinking about the comfort for kids to go outside, but also the availability of certain um, materials, you know, there we're still lacking in certain colors that haven't popped yet. Um, you know, in the winter, we have to consider what uh, restrictions we have and also safety aspects we have to take care of. Um, so it's just, uh, it's really, it's really thinking about, you know, all that's available to us at these different times. and. Um, the videos that I've come across about, you know, I, I love the idea of the colorful tick, you know, I think they're the most disgusting creatures on earth, but trying to create beauty in something like that is, is fantastic. And one of the videos that I saw was um, making insects out of different materials, whether it's leaves and berries and sticks and all this stuff, but beautiful, beautiful examples of various insects. And so it's just... <sighs> There's so much out there 
And, you know, for me, I guess one of the struggles is what do I pick? And what are, what's going to interest my students? You know, not, you know, not everything we choose is going to interest them as well. So it's like, you know, how broad do we go without making things too confusing? Yes, definitely all relevant questions right now. Um, I agree that things are looking up in terms of color and that, um, you know, we have to push kids to get out there regardless of what is available in terms of materials. Um, even if the assignment is just to go outside and be outside and draw something, you know, they don't necessarily have to use what they find. Um, so I'll continue here. Um, plot and continue. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, integrating is a passion of mine. Um, these are just a few examples of things that classroom teachers have really been the motivation behind. Um, Trout in the Classroom is a national program that um, allows teachers to uh, obtain uh, trout eggs and hatch them in their classroom and then um, to raise them and release them. And the Trout in the Classroom program uh, really encourages an exchange of ideas between schools. They have a trout quilt that some of you may have participated in where students each create a, a trout square and then send them off to someone in another uh, elementary school across the country. And then in return, you receive a number of uh, quilt squares. So we did that project last year and it was very successful and exciting for the kids. Uh, the River Studies is a a unit that we've done a couple times in Reading, where I teach, uh, where we traced a river from its source to its confluence with the Connecticut. And that was a really engaging um, unit, which allowed us with just two field trips, I mean, the river flows by the school, so we have constant access to it, but with one field trip to kind of the beginning before it came to school, and then another field trip to the the lower section of the river, we were able to get a lot of artwork done and then created a kind of accordion journal with um, a wood burned cover. That was a great project and not terribly difficult to accomplish. Kids love the field trips. Uh, the life cycles and the signs of spring are both units that um, happen pretty regularly. The life cycles in the primary classrooms and the signs of spring uh, in this case happened with the older grades, uh, but they were both opportunities to kind of incorporate objectives that I had in terms of symmetry and line um, with the, the natural outdoor um, component. So those were fun. Um, nature photography is a great one. And I think most kids today have access to some sort of phone or device, uh, an iPad that will allow them to take photos. Um, I found with teaching just four really basic principles that you see here, that kids feel really um, empowered and can go out and take great photos. Um, these are mostly photos, uh, again, taken at the National Park um, in a program that happens every fall in our district where the sixth graders from all of our local schools come together for a week and study um, ecosystems. And we call it the Web of Life Week. And I typically run a nature photography slash environmental art station each year. So that's my, um, my good fortune again to have a place where I can do that consistently for a whole week. Um, drawing trees, I think right now, uh, particularly with things budding and some things are starting to flower, but I'm seeing a lot of buds, that this is a great time to really encourage kids to choose um, a tree and draw it or paint it over time, or to find a bunch of different trees in one place, or to choose different times of day, like Monet. Um, to do close-ups, distant views, whatever, but to really spend some time um, looking carefully at trees and watching um, the phenology of them. So now I'm going to turn it to 
cat because um, I'd like her to describe her Signs of Spring slideshow that it's a collaborative effort that I think wouldn't be terribly difficult for any of you to create through Google Slides. Cat, are you there? Yes, sure, thanks. Um, I see uh, Luis put a link to it in the chat. Um, it's just a Google slideshow that I update once a week based on information from the outside story book uh, published by, um, uh, what's that magazine, Northern Woodlands. Um, yep, and uh, from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies Field Guide to April. And um, well, and then hopefully May next week. Um, and uh, I, I update it every week with uh, new signs of spring that might be happening around us. And then uh, anyone can access it to add to it. Um, images, questions, poems, um, anything that they're seeing in the area around them as a way of, of looking for hope in the landscape around us during this time as a way of like saying, oh, I can't believe you heard the papers already. I haven't heard them yet. Um, although they did finally start in Plymouth this week. Um, so it's a, it's a really fun collaborative um, way for people to sort of be creative, but also observational. Yeah, I think people have really enjoyed it. I think there are like 60 slides at this point and yeah. it just keeps getting augmented each week. Um, I look forward to it very much. I'm glad. Um, as someone mentioned, let's see, who's the pastel artist? Uh, can't remember. Somebody's been doing pastels. I think it was Beverly. Yeah, Beverly, that's right. Um, they're just an, a great material, um, so easy to transport outside with kids. And again, with the whole notion of phonology, um, if you keep track of the dates of, you know, when the daffodils first appeared at school, you can look back through the years and, and kind of compare. Um, I just find that pastels, the ability to blend them, the different qualities that kids give to them, they just offer endless potentials. And um, these are just some examples of spring, summer, and fall pastels that happen. We don't usually get out to do pastels in the winter, and I don't know why we don't. Um, we really should. So that's a goal. Yeah. Um, so just a few authors, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but um, there are some picture book authors who do a really great job of um, incorporating scientific, accurate scientific information. Um, even with Steve, Steve Jenkins, he does those actual size books where you're seeing um, creatures in their actual size in the book. But these books are not only accurate scientifically, but they are just beautiful to look at. And I included uh, a website in the lower left called Run Wild My Child, which really focuses on beautiful nature books. So if you're at a loss for something new, I would encourage you to check out that site and, and see what else they have to offer. Um, and finally, just a few great resources. I'm sure you all have shelves full of books, uh, but these are some of my kind of go-to resources that I use often. Um, and I'm finding that there is so much online that it's kind of this um, sinkhole that you get into and that you really have to bring yourself back to um, what feels easy and what feels simple and what will kids um, feel able to do, what's feasible. Um, because there are sometimes, and I know parents are, get, are pretty overwhelmed, but there are times when something looks amazing, but there's just that one material that they can't find, or um, you know, just that one step that seems a little too difficult. So I'm encouraging simplicity. I'm encouraging us all to adjust our expectations a little bit. And now with the weather getting nice, we're going to have to work even harder to get kids outdoors. So. Uh, let's support one another and find ways to do that. So that's it for me, Joan. Well, great. Well, I have to say, even with the sun shining outside, which drives me a little crazy to be inside, that was very refreshing. There was something about 
you have a very calming tone, Lisa. <laughs> and it's really nice to hear other people too, just kind of pitching with, with all their great ideas. We have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. And, you know, I think we had um, my also uh, just thoughts about, you know, equity. How do we make sure everybody has those materials that we, that, you know, pastels or whatever. Um, so um, if anybody has any questions, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, or, comment. or comments or whatever. Um, Lisa, are your um, slides from your presentation available? Oh, I'd be happy to share them. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Um, what's the best way to do that, Joan? Luis is on it. He just put it on the website. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, why don't I why don't I just real quickly show you where that is before we run out of time? Okay. So we know where all this is. Uh, right here, I think we are. Okay. So here. Oop. Excuse me. Can you guys see go, that? Go to print. Mm -hmm. All right. All this publish. Um, where's preview? Where it next to publish, you can preview it. All right. Sorry, my. Mm. Nope. Okay. <laughs> Boy. Uh, okay. So publish. Here we go. Yeah, you want to go to the arrow next to publish and select preview. Nope. To the right. Oh, I, okay, sorry guys, my, my little Zoom is getting in the way of this. Okay, here we go, preview. You can see how we do this. Very easy to make these, by the way, uh, these little uh, Google sites. So um, we have some of the, uh, this material right under here, under adventures. Um, and here's a link to Lisa's slides right here. So it's under adventure series and then shared resources. We have the resources that um, Lisa shared, almost all of them here, although we, we recategorized a few of them in some of these other categories. And then connections and reflections, that's where we've put Kat's slide and some of her, some other ideas that we have. Actually, Kat Wright has this um, sound map uh, bingo which has been really fun too that you might want to check out. So just a quick little go through for that. And then we're back to questions. And if anybody has any questions about the website, they can email me. Um, I just wanted to show you guys this quickly, just in case this is uh, something you want to do with your kids. I teach at Brattleboro Union High School sculpture along with Dave and Clark. And um, I just did this with my foundations and sculpture class. And what it is, is I had them just take a silhouette of an animal and they're going to, they're taking glue and they're just filling it in. So it's really easy. And if they didn't have glue, they could draw that on the ground and fill it in with sticks. So, um, and then my other kids that wanted to do something more advanced, they're making a sculpture in the round. So if you wanna know more about that, I can share that stuff with you. But I'm finding that a lot of my students don't have materials, like they don't even have glue, you know? So um, that's where they can make that sculpture on the ground. But thank you so much, both of you. Um, that was really inspiring and I've, got some ideas to play it off for high school kids so thank yeah, you I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I don't have as many high school ideas but have to be true to who I am <laughs> no no oh no, it's great it's great I'm thinking about the mandala a personal symbol you know they with you know anyways it's it's yeah. running through my mind now thank I you. had a student yesterday who made a mandala with the scraps from his lunch it was brilliant <laughs> <laughs> and we most of us have food i hope right yeah, and uh lauren um a lot of these outdoor art projects really lend themselves to writing so the first project my sixth through eighth graders did was based on andrew goldsworthy and they then had to write a haiku that um either explained Goldsworthy's work or connected his work to the work that they made. And they made, they wrote some beautiful haikus. So a lot of times these, the art projects can be great prompts for writing assignments. 
Yeah. Yeah. We're doing exactly the same thing in Reading this week. It's Andy Goldsworthy and Haiku Week. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, good news. Well, you guys, an, another important thing before we wrap up is the, the reason, the other reason why we do it is we're trying to connect with local resources like Lisa and Artistry or, you know, iNaturalist and um, Vermont Center for Eco Studies or Vital Communities or Shelburne Farms. So I really, really encourage teachers where they're feeling like they need that spark or support or to share that load because it's a huge load to reach out to these resources because there are people who are very eager to help. Um, and even, you know, if you all are like, oh gosh, I really want to know how Kathleen did that stick sculpture or, you know, some of these other things, feel free to touch base with us and we'll, you know, you guys can connect directly or ask us who is that person who suggested this? We'll try to our best to remember. Well, this will be a recording, so you might, we'll put it on the website so you can also check that way. But um, we really appreciate everybody jumping in and sharing their expertise. So any final questions? No, I just have a final challenge to pose to people. Um, I'll have to pull this out. For a long time, I've been doing um, art on my clothesline. And um, this is what one looks like. Here, I'll show you. Let's see. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. So that is just clothing turned into letters. And you don't have to do letters. Um, but I left that one up for a week, and it snowed. And then um, I left it up one day when the sun was shining. Can you see the shadow in there? That's Abby when she was a baby. Um, but anyway, I think you can take some of your daily chores and turn those into beautiful tasks as well. So the next time you're hanging um, clothes on your laundry line, think about how you can make that beautiful too. Thank you, and I just want to thank everybody um, so much. This was really fun, and thanks to the team, Luis, Kat, and Lisa, and to all of you for doing what you do. So, hope to see you again. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. This was great. <laughs>